All right, good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you once again for joining us today on another beautiful day in St. John. And um, today I'm excited to introduce uh, to you Dr. Ashley O'Brien, whom obviously many of you know, but for those of you who don't, he is an esteemed member of our Department of Anesthesiology, uh, but obviously more specific to us, he is uh, one of our uh, cardiac anesthesiologists. And we're fortunate to have an extremely strong group of uh, cardiac anesthesiologists, uh, some of who are on the line today. Um, and they, are, uh, they have been invaluable as we've uh, pushed forward a lot of different agendas over the years, uh, and uh, from ECMO to, uh, to TAVI. And specifically, I think what we wanted to talk a little bit about today was just sedation, because we use it across the heart center. It's not just specific to surgery. Uh, we see it in the, in the EP lab. We see it in the cath lab. Um, and I thought this would be a, a, a neat topic, and Ashley obviously agreed and uh, has, has offered to do this. Ashley uh, did his uh, anesthesiology training at Dell when I was there, uh, and that's how I got to know him, and I was uh, quite shocked when he showed up here in St. John. I was quite disappointed, actually. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, and no, but more seriously, though, a Ashley has... Uh, uh, went on to uh, St. Mike's in Toronto, and uh, there he did his uh, fellowship in cardiac anesthesia, and, and we've been fortunate to have him for the last 10 plus years. So Ashley, without further ado, I'll pass it over to you. Wow, thanks for that introduction. Um, so the most stressful part about this talk is finishing on time, uh, because I know answer is a bit of a stickler. I have 20 minutes sharp. So I'll even skip the objective slide that everyone gives and just get uh, right into it. The talk's a bit St. John centric, because of course, we are the only center that do TAVIs. Um, but I'm hoping that um, the referring centers that send TAVIs to us will, will learn a bit about how we how we do our anesthesia for these procedures. Um, so you can't really talk about TAVIs without talking about the burden of aortic stenosis. Um, it's estimated that about 5% of people over the age of 65 have either moderate or severe aortic stenosis. And there are risk factors for this, such as hypertension, smoking, dyslipidemia. But in reality, age is the most predominant risk factor. Aortic stenosis is a disease of the elderly. And the older your population is, then the more aortic stenosis that you're going to have. So this, this refers both to absolute number. You can see here that the population of Canada has doubled uh, since 1970. But it also refers to sort of the stratification of ages within your population. So if you look at the population pyramid in 1950, it's shaped like a pyramid. Lots of young people at the bottom paying taxes to pay for the health care of the older people at the top. And quite surprisingly, um, there were only a couple hundred thousand people in the entire country of Canada in 1950 that were aged 80 and above. Remarkable when you think about it. Now, fast forward to today, and um, this population pyramid was built by the Egyptians when they had sunstroke, I think. You can tell it's uh, got a lot of bellies jutting out. And you can, you can see that we start to have troubles with not enough young people to pay taxes to care for all of the older people. And as everyone knows, this is the baby boomer generation um, moving up. So we've all heard of the gray tsunami and um, I think this is a great cartoon of it. I'm not going to say that this sort of thing keeps me up at night, but I do think a bit about the hundreds and hundreds of healthcare ailments that only increase in number um, as you age. And I think about the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that we're going to have to um, spend to try to care for all of these uh, aging people. And I wonder sometimes how we're going to do it over the next 20 or 30 years. But uh, that's a topic for another time. Uh, getting back to aortic stenosis, this is a um, graph, it's American data and it shows the number of interventions. So basically either surgical AVR or a TAVI on uh, people each year. And the line of best fit slopes up. It's not a huge slope, but it is steady. And from 2003 to 2016, the number of interventions for aortic stenosis increased 33%. And um, with the gray tsunami, this is only going to get worse. So what are we going to do about this? Well, TAVIs came along. This is Dr. Alain Cribier. He's a French interventional cardiologist, and he performed the first TAVI in man in 2002. And really, thank goodness, thank goodness they did come along when they did, because I'm not entirely sure how we would be able to keep up with the numbers of burgeoning aortic stenosis. But luckily, TAVI, uh, when you compare the two, TAVI completed in 60 to 90 minutes, 
and patient goes home the next day for the most part. Uh, surgical AVR completed in about four hours. Patient is in hospital for five days, uh, sometimes more if there's a complication. So we can crank out four or five of these in a day and um, really keep up. And it's a, it's a compelling uh, new technology and it's really one of the more revolutionary things that's happened in medicine in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. So as I mentioned, he was first in man in 2002 and quite remarkable, it was only eight years later that we did our first TAVI in St. John. Uh, that is uh, quite a quick advancement. And in the, in the initial years, they were only done in um, what we call prohibitive risk patients, patients who just absolutely um, were not surgical candidates because they're too high risk. But it was opened up to what we call high risk patients in 2012, intermediate risk in 2016, and low risk patients in 2019. And we did our first TAVI under sedation here in St. John in 2016. Um, now, just last year, uh, this has been mentioned, I think, in prior Heart Center rounds on Wednesday mornings, but the newest iteration of the valve guidelines recommend that either a TAVI or surgical AVR can be done for patients age 65 to 80. And the idea is that a discussion would be had between the healthcare provider and the patient uh, regarding the risks and benefits of these two modalities uh, for patients in this age group. However, TAVIs have sort of been around a while and patients realize that they can either have this, uh, cold hard steel splitting their sternum, or they can have this, a nice slippery hydrophilic catheter um, going up their femoral artery. And so a lot of these patients, they already come with a decision made. And so I think it's, it's obvious that TAVIs, um, they're only going to increase in number. Uh, this idea of doing them in people as young as 65 who are low risk, it's controversial, there's no doubt. Um, but I think um, it's obvious that, you know, the, the train is coming down the tracks. So this is data for around the world, the number of TAVIs that are done each year. And I can tell you that this data was put out before TAVIs were opened up to low risk patients and before... Um, uh, the 2020 valve guidelines came out. So we're doing hundreds of thousands of TAVIs every year now. And similar curve at the MB Heart Center. 2020, we had a record of 124, and that was with COVID where things slowed down a bit. So in the early 2010s, some centers started doing these under conscious sedation. And you can see in the first quarter of 2016, about a third of patients in the United States are done under conscious sedation, start to level out a bit, but reach two thirds by the first quarter of 2019. And a lot of this was made uh, possible uh, due to advances in technology. The delivery system is now down to a 14 French, which means that these cases can now be done under um, fully percutaneous conditions with a per close device at the end. And so eventually when enough centers are doing these under conscious sedation, then people started putting out studies comparing them with general anesthesia. And then eventually meta-analyses started to come out. So this was um, one of the first meta-analyses, but I mean, basically they're all the same. This one compared 26 studies with over 10,000 patients. And they found that there's no significant difference in many of the outcomes, including uh, stroke, cardiovascular mortality, and at the bottom, um, most importantly, probably procedural success. However, uh, there was a significant difference in 30-day mortality, uh, favoring sedation, 4.5% versus 6.2%. And so when this analysis came out and a couple of others like it, this raised some eyebrows and a lot of centers decided Okay, we're going to move to conscious sedation. You can see in the bottom line, length of stay, seven days versus nine days. And that was not unusual at that time. And that shows you how far we've come and that we now uh, discharge patients the next day. So um, as I mentioned, this trial looked at 26 different studies. The problem is that all the studies, save for one, were observational, O for observational in design. So the problem with observational studies is there's a lot of selection bias. Uh, the anesthesiologist can use whichever method they want. So if a patient came to them who's hemodynamically unstable, they might say, well, I'm going to do this patient under sedation. Whereas if a patient came to them with heart failure, they might say, well, I think I'll intubate this patient um, so I don't have to deal with dyspnea throughout the case. And there's also a lot of confounders. So things have changed greatly um, 
from 2010 when we first started doing these to now. And what has happened is we've um, started doing more of what's called the minimalist approach for TAVI. So when we first started doing TAVIs, they were done under general anesthesia. The patient was intubated. The patient was paralyzed. There was an arterial line placed, a central line, Swangans catheter, temporary pacemaker wire, Foley catheter, transesophageal echo, femoral cut down, and they went to the ICU post-op. So you think about just how long it took me to say those things. You can imagine how long it takes to do them all and then actually, you know, proceed with the case. So the minimalist approach, what many centers, ours included, moved to was patients would be done under sedation. They'd have transthoracic echo, which of course is non-invasive. Uh, and we would utilize the sidearm of the femoral lines that are put in by the interventionalists anyway. So then we didn't have to put any lines in the neck and these patients were done under percutaneous approach. So the benefit to all this is that if you look at all the things on the left, a lot of them are invasive and people don't want to remove them until they're absolutely sure they don't need them. And so a lot of these patients would kind of linger with a central line in a day longer than they truly needed it. And so this really prolonged the length of stay. And it wasn't really necessarily due to the top line via i.e. Uh, general anesthesia or sedation. It was just more due, due to delays in discharge because there are so many lines to be removed and people didn't want to remove them until they're absolutely sure they didn't need them anymore. But with the minimalist approach, these patients leave the suite with a single IV and that is, that is all they have left um, when they go to the recovery room. So really, they're, I mean, they're one step from the highway. And so in addition from moving to, from the old approach to the minimalist approach over this period of time, there have been um, much better products released by the company that um, have smaller delivery devices are easier to insert, um, greatly reduce the amount of paravalvular leak. And of course, our teams have just become more experienced. So to say that, um, Conscious sedation has lower mortality than general anesthesia in these observational trials is it's a little bit misleading because general anesthesia was done more in the beginning when, when teams weren't exper as experienced and conscious sedation was done more recently when teams are more experienced and are using the better products. So finally, in uh, just this past October, the first randomized trial came out comparing general anesthesia to sedation in TAVI and it was called the solve TAVI trial multi-center randomized prospective trial in Germany. And they looked at patients over three years. I don't want to get into the details too much uh, because of time, but the primary endpoint was a composite of all-cause mortality, stroke, MI, infection, and acute kidney injury at 30 days. And this study was designed to show equivalence of this primary endpoint. And baseline characteristics, obviously too small to read, but I can tell you there are no uh, significant differences. Um, both groups, conscious sedation and GA, were similar. The general anesthesia arm was intubated. They use mostly IV anesthesia, which is a bit different than um, us in, um, in Canada. We tend to use more inhalational anesthesia, but they were extubated at the end of the case. And the sedation arm used light to moderate anesthesia um, to the extent that they were able to respond purposefully to verbal commands. And um, they use mostly propofol, opioids, dexmedetomidine. But otherwise, they follow the minimalist approach. And the outcome showed that all-cause mortality um, was equivalent. There's no difference between the two groups, stroke the same, and myocardial infarction the same. So the study was powered to show equivalence between the two groups, and in the end, uh, that is what it showed. Secondary outcomes, again, no significant difference, including hospital stay, uh, duration of anesthesia, etc. The only real major differences were there was significantly more desaturation in the sedation group, and there was a 6% crossover. So 6% of the patients that were sedated actually had to be converted to general anesthesia. And this is mostly due to the need for emergency surgery or the patient just um, couldn't stay still enough. There's always a signal in these trials between sedation and general anesthesia with respect to vasopressor use. Um, so more vasopressors used in the general anesthesia arm but this is a binary outcome and we don't know how much vasopressor, how many vasopressors are used um, it may have just been a small amount. So what did we learn? Well, we learned that in the only randomized prospective trial, the benefit of sedation disappeared compared to what we saw in the observational trials. And so these findings suggest that both anesthesia strategies could be used um, in these patients for TAVIs. However, 
um, I think I can speak for most of my anesthesia colleagues when I say that if I were to do a general anesthesia for a TAVI today, I wouldn't intubate the patient um, because these patients aren't having a major cavity entered their abdomen, their thorax, their cranium. Um, really, it's a peripheral surgery, even though the meat of the action is occurring inside the heart, the surgery is occurring at the groin. So most of us would do these patients with an LMA, which I think we've all heard of. They've been around for decades. And the benefit of an LMA is that it's um, not nearly as stimulating as an endotracheal tube. It doesn't traverse the vocal cords. It doesn't enter the trachea. And in addition, the patient doesn't have to be paralyzed. So a general anesthetic with an LMA and lots of um, local anesthesia in the groin, the patients can be um, made, or sorry, driven quite light and have a light anesthesia. So if I were to do one of these today, and I did one um, just last week, I would use the minimalist approach in all things, use the sidearm of the femoral lines, except I would take out sedation, um, insert LMA, and the patient would still leave the OR with a single IV. So I was looking for um, studies on these um, this comparison, and there's only been one, and it comes out next June in the Journal of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia, and it looked at um, general anesthesia versus LMA in these patients. And um, I can tell you that the LMA arm used a long-acting vapor and kept them a bit deeper, 1 to 1.5 MAC, which is a measure of depth of anesthesia, um, than we would, but still, um, it is a comparison. And what they found was that in hospital length of stay, there's no difference. Both groups went home the next day. Again, there is more vasopressors used in the LMA group and 30 day mortality, no change. So this was a retrospective observational study. And I know I sort of railed on that uh, earlier saying they're, they're not any good, but uh, in this case, so far it's all we have, though randomized trials are being done. Uh, it did show that there's more vasopressor use in the LMA group, but there's no difference in post-operative outcomes, including, of course, most importantly, mortality. So if you do a light GA with short-acting agents with an LMA, this represents another option uh, for these patients if you still maintain the other components of the minimalist approach. And, and, and that's important that you continue to do that. So the advantages to this for us is, number one, patient comfort. These are old patients, osteoporotic spines, osteoarthritic spines laying completely flat for at least 60 minutes. Um, it gets uncomfortable. In addition, um, in the beginning, they're exposed completely naked with about 12 people in the room, bright lights, they're growing slopped with chlorhexidine. And it's a little disconcerting. I mean, it may sound minor to us, but I don't think it's minor to the patient. Uh, in addition to all this, if you have an LMA in, like the title of the talk kind of said, you can set it and forget it. There's less time attending to the airway if the patient gets too deep or if they're too light and they're moving around a bit, there's less time coaching the patient. You can just sort of um, take care of them hemodynamically and otherwise and, and not worry about the other a little bit more mundane stuff. There's less patient movement, less desaturation. And if you have an airway in, like an LMA, it's easier to handle the, the things that pop up at a left field, such as an annual rupture or the need for a permanent pacemaker or a vascular injury. You don't, you're not scrambling trying to uh, obtain an airway. And these patients still have fast recovery. We do 80, 90 year old people for cystoscopy day surgery every day. And you know, within an hour, they're up and going home. So, you know, this is not reinventing the wheel. So, Edwards is a company that um, produces one of the TAVI valves, and it's the one we use most here in St. John. And they have this program called the Benchmark, where they're going throughout the continent and trying to get centers to sort of conform to what they would. Um, say is the ideal way to do a TAVI. And uh, part of their benchmark is that the patient should all be done under conscious sedation. And we had a meeting last night with them and they sort of looked at, at our results and our results are excellent, but our um, conscious sedation result is, is a little less than adequate. And they sort of asked why and I, I got on and I kind of confessed. I said, well, I do most of mine under deep sedation, whereas Edwards wants zero to minimal sedation. And um, you know, I didn't want to go all through it, the reasons why I didn't really think that um, deep sedation was a bad thing. Uh, they would just sort of view it as sour grapes. You know, the anesthesiologist doesn't want to do what we say. So I didn't really say anything. But one of our interventionalists, uh, Dr. Brian Archer, spoke up and, and he basically said, you know, uh, I don't see the point of doing these with no sedation just to brag and be able to say we did it. You know, he thinks it's an uncomfortable procedure. And he said that if you were going to have a TAVI, he would want to be, I know, uh, sedate the heck out of me, he said. And so I was sort of glad that he, he, he said that. You know, really, I think 
the old saying, there's a lot of things you can do while standing up in a canoe, but why bother? And um, I think that really applies here. I think that if you look at uh, the pendulum, we started over here with general anesthesia and lots of lines in the beginning. The pendulum swung all the way over to here with the minimalist approach. But I think perhaps it's gone a bit too far. And I think if we take one step back to position B, um, then the patients will be a bit more comfortable, there'll be a lot less movement for the proceduralists. And I think the outcomes will be uh, equivalent, which is what the studies are beginning to show. Um, in the interest of time, I think I'll skip this slide. So in summary, I would say that the burden of aortic stenosis is only going to increase in Canada. Luckily, we do have TAVIs now so that um, we can try to keep up with the increasing numbers. But the full scale approach we took in the beginning is no longer needed. And um, I believe that a light J with an LMA is not inferior to sedation. I think that um, studies have already come out um, showing this, and I think they'll continue to come out. And um, you know, we'll have to have a discussion amongst our group, uh, especially and with Edwards, to to see if this is the sort of thing we can do. So um, certainly take any questions. But I'd also, before I finish, like to thank Ansar, and we all know he's going to. Uh, uh, Maine at the end of the summer. I've done hundreds of cardiac cases with him since I came here in 2010. And uh, as we were testing out my new iPhone, this is a picture of us at seven o'clock one night taking a patient to the ICU. And so uh, we're all going to miss him, but we wish him all the best. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. That's very nice of you to say. Great picture of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Ashley. That's fantastic. Great talk. Uh, great summary. I'm just going to... Um, Maybe we can, I'll just uh, stop sharing your screen. Uh, sure. And then that way we can. So uh, just a, a quick question from my standpoint, and obviously I'll let, uh, I'll let the people weigh in that have uh, done the most work on this. Uh, do you think to some extent uh, the Edwards drive is a little bit to get to uh, a truly a day procedure where you know people come in the morning of their TAVI, have their TAVI and then go home that afternoon? Do uh, you think that's their ultimate drive so that they can make this as much of a kind of an outpatient, come in, come out, see you later? Because even right now, I mean, there's very little that happens between, I would say, by the time the TAVI patient comes back to our ward, provided that they haven't needed a pacemaker, um, you know, till the next morning, it's pretty much rubber stamp, see you later, out you go. We're very fortunate. We've got a great program and great outcomes. But I wonder to what extent that's the that's a bit of the driver to go into that sort of level zero to one sedation. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I think I think everyone would like it if the patient could go home the same day. I mean, obviously that's just fewer beds that are occupied, and that would be great. I don't necessarily know if, um, as I sort of mentioned, if sedation is what's holding them back. We do you know thousands of day surgeries every day with LMAs, and the patients go home the same day. Part of me wonders if they 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 charge us so much for these valves that if they, if they're kind of trying to add a value added service with this, you know, benchmark program and, and they're kind of, you know, able to say, you know, look what we're doing for the, you, uh, but in reality, it doesn't cost them much to do this benchmark. And so, and so they're kind of able to claim that. Um, I think um, if we wanted to, we could send them home the same day. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily know if there's much in this program that, that is going to add to that. I think we could do it on our own if we wanted to. Um, sometimes just logistical issues in local institutions sort of prevent that. So I got a couple of comments. So um, I said to JF last night, we, I agree with you, Ashley, we could send them all home the same day if JF wants to finish his two hours and come back at eight o'clock to send them home. That's a, there's nothing keeping them here. My other comment is, you know, we've seen a dramatic change in, um, probably the use of pressors and the hemodynamic stability of the patients going from general anesthetic to not general anesthetic. And that's the biggest difference I see. So we're having to scurry less to get things done and do a little less CPR than we used to do in the beginning. So, um, and, I'm, and I guess there's a, you know, talk about that pendulum, I guess the deeper they are, probably the more risk of that, the less deep they are, the less risk. And I think that our anesthesia seems to be pretty tailored to the patient and exactly what we're doing. The more stuff we have to do, the deeper the patient is, the less stuff we have to do, the lighter the patient is. So it seems to be a tailored approach as opposed to this is what we're going to do all the time to every patient, regardless of what's going on. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Vern. JF? 
Yeah, I was just going to, no, thank you very much, Ashley, for, for the comments. And I think you bring a lot of perspective, which is great. Uh, I still think it's good to push ourselves to ask the question of what's necessary and not necessary. And I think you bring it back at the end to, you know, I think we've pushed the envelope quite hard here, but as long as you keep the goal in mind and the goal in mind has to be, you know, whatever sedation you require to allow the patient to be comfortable and, and well, and not require vasopressor, as Vern is pointing out, is very, very helpful. And the last one is early recovery, and that you've clearly demonstrated probably doesn't matter. So uh, I guess I'll be provocative a little bit is, can you imagine a world where you might not actually need uh, yourself or the same way as myself uh, there? You know, this is theoretically the way this is moving along. So I'm trying to be provocative a little bit here. Yeah, no, I can imagine that world. And in fact, I didn't, um, I didn't bring this paper to the to the talk, but there, I did see a paper from Ireland. And in most of the public hospitals in Ireland, there is no anesthesiologist at their TAVIs. Um, so I presume those patients are done mo mo mainly like a coronary angiogram, a little bit of sedation provided by the interventional cardiologist, and uh, you know, away you go. And that that could be done here. There's no doubt about it. Um, same uh, as you mentioned with respect to yourself. The problem, of course, is when they go south. And um, <clears throat> um, we don't have a lot of flex in our department. Uh, if you need an anesthesiologist within three minutes, and specifically, hopefully a cardiac anesthesiologist, well, you're probably not going to get them unless we've been assigned to that list already. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I agree. These are tough. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, I'm going to ask Andrew just, uh, you know, as another cardiac anesthesiologist who's been doing this since, the, you know, the beginning of the heart center, What's, what's your take a little bit on this paradigm shift and how we're moving and, and uh, any thoughts? You, you'll just have to unmute yourself. Hard for him to, well. There we go. Here we there go. There we are, that's better. Can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, originally, when we started doing this, I thought people um, trying to do it under just sedation were insane. I thought, my God, how can you possibly do that if anything goes wrong? And fortunately, so far, I haven't really been involved in any of the cases where we've had major issues that have required a much more invasive approach. So my perspective is, as Ashley said, I try and tailor make it to the individual patient. Um, it's very rare that I don't have a patient move to some degree, um, but our interventional radiologists and cardiologists are very patient. If a patient starts to move, they just sort of hold them down a little bit. I have spoken to all of the patients that we've done, that I did, none of them have any memory of it at all. And that to me is a big, is a big deal because anesthesia is you know, defined as allowing the surgery to go ahead and having the patient be comfortable, but also have no memory of anything unpleasant that may have happened. So that's kind of a roundabout way of saying that if we can continue to do it the way we're doing it, that's fine. Um, I haven't actually used an LMA in any of these patients. Uh, we've supported the airway in other ways as we need to, and the medications that we use are very short acting. So most of the time patients are, are, are pretty good. The only caveat to that sorry to be so long-winded, is if there's a vascular complication at the end of the case where you might need to take the patient to the main op operating room and have a vascular surgeon repair the groin, that might be a little easier to do if your airway is not an issue, if, you're, if, you're, you know, if you have an LMA in and the patient's under control. But some of those things occur an hour or two hours or three hours after the procedure's over. And that would make me think, let's not send them home the same day if they have, if there's any risk of a vascular complication. That's really all I have to say. Excellent point. Excellent point. Ashley, quick question, uh, just from uh, Dr. Alugo. How much pain do these patients actually have during the procedure? Virtually none. Yeah, during the procedure, I would say very little. Um, the interventionalists are used to um, doing things on patients that really have no sedation, so that they're quite li liberal with their local anesthetic. There are some instances, though, where a vessel has to be uh, dilated, often the iliac artery, sometimes even up into the abdominal aorta. Uh, that can be quite uncomfortable, even with um, uh, local anesthesia, but it, but it's it's generally uh, pretty short duration. Um, I think oftentimes it's more so the the longer they're there. Like I said, just they're not used to lying completely flat with 
knees not flexed, hips not flexed, lumbar spine not flexed, you know, and it's a hard table that that can become uncomfortable as well. Absolutely. Especially in the age group that we're typically doing. Uh, Ashley, thank you so much for taking the time to put this talk together. I think it was a great overview. And uh, I think thank you to the anesthesia group as a whole. And then, you know, for, for really kind of helping to push the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the train forward on this front, I think so much of what we do and what we've accomplished in the TAVI world, I can speak from an outsider, is, is, is a testament to the uh, collaborative uh, efforts of all the different subspecialties that are in that room. So congratulations to everyone uh, and uh, well done and uh, have a great day. And next week, um, we were gonna have Dr. James French from the emergency department talk to us about simulation, something that they've done a lot of in Emerge and how it may apply to our world at the Heart Center. Have a good one. Thanks, take care. Thank you. Thank you.